But the goal is, you know, to have then the appropriate processes in play and partnership with those teams so that we've, you know, got proven processes to identify and close those on a continual basis with the goal being that what we're shipping to our customers has no known product security defects in them. Uh, you know, given what we do, of course, as an organization, uh, a nightmare scenario for me is that some sort of uh, cyber criminal was able to leverage our products uh, as that that vehicle to compromise one of our customers. And, and so, of course, product security is one of our primary focuses as, as a result. Hi, you're listening to The Secure Developer. It's part of the DevSecCon community a platform for developers, operators, and security people to share their views and practices on DevSecOps, Dev and Sec collaboration, cloud security, and more. Check out devsecon.com to join the community and find other great resources. This podcast is sponsored by Sneak. Sneak's developer security platform helps developers build secure applications without slowing down. Fixing vulnerabilities in code, open source, containers, and infrastructure as code. To learn more, visit sneak.io forward slash TSD. That's S-N-Y-K dot I-O forward slash TSD. On today's episode, Guy Pajani, founder of Sneak, talks to Tim Crothers, Chief Security Officer at Mandiant. Tim is a seasoned security leader with over 20 years of experience building and running information security programs, large and complex incident response engagements, and threat and vulnerability assessments. He has a deep experience in cyber threat intelligence, reverse engineering, and computer forensics. He has authored 17 books to date, as well as regularly training and speaking engagements at information security conferences. We hope you enjoyed their conversation, and don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes if you enjoyed today's episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Secure Developer. Thanks for tuning back in. Today, we're going to look at the big picture, you know, and how do we modernize security and sort of, you know, even take a, both a, a local or internal look as well as an interested look on modern security and DevSecOps. And to guide us through all of that and uh, get his views on it, we have uh, Tim Crothers, who is SVP and Chief Security Officer at Mandiant. Tim, thanks for coming onto the show. Oh, thanks for having me. So, Tim, before we dig in here and you know talk uh, all things DevSecOps, tell us a little bit about what you do and maybe a bit of the journey that got you sort of into security and 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 through to where you are today. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm old. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. I got into into IT back in mid '80s. Actually, hobby before that even, but college and university in the mid '80s. And did what we would now consider infrastructure for better part of a decade. And then in 1994, this thing called the internet popped up. And, you know, because I was in infrastructure, of course, the, the first bit of, of security was really firewalls, which of course are really just routers with rules. And uh, it kind of was a, a natural progression. And I've been just crazy fortunate to proceed from there and been able to participate kind of in the information security and now cybersecurity, we call it, industry as it as it grew and developed. Over the course of that, worked for lots and lots of different organizations, also spent some time in law enforcement, and yeah, just been uh, crazy fortunate to get to work with crazy talented people and learn from them and get better. And I'm curious what uh, what drew you into security in the first place. Do you remember what uh, what caught your attention? I love the protection mission. You know the the defense. You know same same thing that drew me to to law enforcement for a while. But the the thing I've come to love over time even more. I would say well that drew me in is what I love about cybersecurity is we. We get to play in everybody's sandboxes, right? Effective cybersecurity is is not just DevSecOps, but it's you know it's network, it's infrastructure, it's people, it's intel, it's reverse engineering, and you know we could go on and on, right? And that I think is the fun part is uh, we you know we get to play in uh, literally everybody's sandbox at one point or another. Very cool. And you're, uh, you know, one of the things that kind of jumps up a bit when you uh, look at your resume is the the few years that you spent in customer success, you know, within Mandiant, but I think in your previous iteration in, in Mandiant, 
I guess it's interesting, you know, Mandy is clearly a security provider. It's not like you left security uh, during that time, but uh, what sparked it and maybe, you know, what of it is left of, of doing a, a role that wasn't, you know, in itself securing internally? Yeah, so, so that was really effect, effectively a, a form of consulting role, right? I'm really passionate about helping organizations be successful in their security outcomes. And of course, as you well know, and our audience understands it's, it's complicated, it's, it's tricky. And, you know, so my customer success role was really going on site with customers and helping them implement Mandian solutions, Mandian's consulting, all of our different capabilities that they were trying to integrate into their essentially operations so that they could come out that other side more successful. And that's fun uh, because you get it such a broad view, right? Every organization is very, very different in many respects. Lots of similarities, of course, but even down to things like individual organizational culture, of course, ends up having a, a piece apart. And so figuring out, hey, how do we help you mature your threat hunting capabilities? How do we help you mature your operational, you know, your security operational capabilities, what have you? You know, my career has been a, a mix of practitioner and vendor side. And, and what I love about both is that ultimately, I, I really like the practitioner side the most because it's the hardest. And I, I love the challenge because it's not just buying tools and putting things. It's how do you really make this work in that organization despite politics and budgets and all of these other real world things that are a part of a, of a business or public organization? But the vendor side gives you such a broader view, right? Because you're working with so many more companies, that gives you less individual depth at those organizations, but a really, you know, helps you get a, a really broad sense of options and approaches and things that companies are doing. And so having both, I think, is, is ultimately where I enjoy. I, I, I can't do one or the other too long without... Uh, We'll missing the other part. Bit. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, but it's great. It's great to have that sort of different perspective. And I'm uh, I'm keen to uh, to tap into some of the learnings, I guess, from uh, from both of those lenses here. So I guess let's let's dig in. Indeed. So we're here to to really explore the the latest and maybe uh, you know that modernization or sort of maturing or at least you know the developer view of it. So when you think about DevSecOps, maybe start from some you know definitions. What does that mean to you when you? someone says, what is DevSecOps to you? How do you explain it? I think it's it's fairly straightforward. It's it's the art of producing uh, functional and secure code. That's pretty short. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, we can't have one without the other, in my view, right? The, the whole point of developing code is to fulfill some sort of function, right? Security, from my perspective, is just an aspect of that building good code. And, and indeed, I've, I've found at several organizations now where, where I've helped build a DevSecOps capability that as we produce more secure code, inevitably, we're producing more quality code as well. The number of defects, you know, many patterns that we use as, as developers and engineers in our code that produce insecure code are also producing uh, functional defects, right? And so it, it's when we get alignment that that chasing that solves both. I, I find that's often a way of really helping engage with the developers and the engineers because this has got to be a partnership, right? This is a fundamental reason I think a lot of our security fails is when we try and dictate and we don't truly partner with the groups that we're trying to help be successful. You know, from my view, my role is to help our engineering teams at Mandiant produce good, secure, functional code quickly, right? We, we need to move fast as a business and partnering on that for that, that outcome together is how we produce things that solve both business needs and security needs yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. ultimately drive innovation often as well. I find. I, I think, uh, so I very much relate to that. How do you think of, of the difference? So you've, you've been around a while. I'm not going to acknowledge the old or not on it, but you've sort of, you know, <laughs> you've, you've sort of seen the uh, industry maybe before this term was started to be adopted. 
what do you think is different? You probably could have said you should have secure and functioning code 20 years ago as well. Sure. Well, I think I think a lot of it is the approaches have changed, right? Just like if you look at, you know, engineering, most organizations have gone from a waterfall methodology to a more agile approach, right? I would say that that security in an industry has has very much followed that same path in that you know, originally a lot of our focus in security was about having the appropriate controls in the appropriate places, which essentially became toll gates of sorts, right? Whereas now it's not that controls aren't still valuable, but the the focus is less about the controls and more about the results. How do we partner to deliver, right? Again, my simple definition of, of product security, I very much like to focus on the outcomes, Are we reducing the number of security defects over time? That's just a simple, but yet really outcome-driven way to measure the effectiveness of our DevSecOps product program is if we track over time the amount of of defects. And then our focus is, well, how do we eliminate those? Are, Are the... Instead of controls, are there approaches like, say, you know, something that's happened at, at many of the advanced engineering organizations is like a service mesh approach, right? Where instead of doing authentication at layer seven in the application, we move that down, especially in a, you know, an API, you know, driven architecture organization, we can drive that down to the transport layer where we're using mutual TLS to to authenticate. It's a great innovation because one, developers no longer have to handle secrets, right? It just takes the whole headache of secrets management off of their plate, which allows them to go faster, yet simultaneously improves the security because no longer secrets embedded in code. We've got better visibility and or observability if you wanna use the SRE term for it, right? which of course inherently gives us better outcomes on the security front. So there's a great specific innovation. Oh, and it also satisfies control of application to the network layer, which means we can probably eliminate a bunch of firewall rule requests and other things in there. So we've simultaneously improved security, allowed our developers to go faster. It's just wins all the way around for the business, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it sounds like a great, uh, great initiative to it. And it's, it's interesting to to think indeed about uh, authorizations and secrets that are sort of the the bane of existence. Well, one of <laughs> in, uh, in sort of the, the modern uh, surrounding and the idea of uh, of taking them off. And you know, I, I definitely relate to that. The notion of uh, you know when you think about some things are defined in code and some are more operations minded and access the system. You know, there's definitely kind of a good argument to be said that that's more about sort of runtime controls than it is necessarily about how the application behaves. Absolutely. Um, so maybe let's take a bit of a a bit of a. I'm actually dislike a bit the sort of you know too much uh, left to right uh, bit because it's a continuous loop. You know, all of our visuals, but still kind of you know like a code to deployment view, a little bit of controls, get a bit of a perspective. When you think about, uh, I guess you talked about less of controls and more about security visibility or tools. But still, when you think about instrumenting or equipping the uh, the development workflow with sort of security insights or or helpers, walk us through it a little bit. What do you what do you like seeing there? So there's where you know I think automation becomes a, a great tool for us, right? You know, it's important if we're going to produce good quality code that we've got consistency, that we've got good practices that, you know, if if I'm checking in and, and writing the code that someone else taking a look at that code and validating it before committing it all the way up and down kind of that chain and then good processes around our testing, you know, at that, just like we've got the QA tests that we're going to want to run on our code. It's a great time to do some of our security quality testing, of course, as well, right? And so the key there from my perspective is just understanding our engineering team's preferred practices, you know, are are you Git centric? Are you, you know, Kubernetes K8s? Are you, you know, what are those patterns so that we can partner to to put those, I, I like to call them guardrails rather than controls, you know, around. So we want to support the outcomes that the teams want to do. We just need to be able to 
ensure that the appropriate practices and processes that they've determined are correct and, and you know typically we'll collaborate on those right are are being followed consistently and that's certainly if you step back and look at the adversarial approach what they're always ultimately if you again if you if you really simplify it down the consistent thing is they're looking for gaps gaps in our processes gaps in our our other things and how can they take advantage of those gaps obviously things like supply chain compromise are uh, are have been demonstrated to be a real threat and so a lot of that can be satisfied just by good process and following good process rather than necessarily having some specific tool to do it but there again is a, a great place where we as an industry there's lots of opportunity for automation because why should we have a need in a in a modern development environment to manually hook all of our tooling into a new project that a engineering team has spun up right they they forked their code they're they're going to take a different path they've spun up a new project and get our tooling should be able to automatically detect that automatically you know hook in and and see the processes going on that without us having to do all the manual care and feeding that was kind of maybe the hallmark of a lot of our legacy software development tooling yeah yeah no those are good tips so let me dig into sort of two things you said there one is the controls versus guardrails i mean terminology is tricky but when you think about those words what words how, how are they different i would say they're different in that when you think of controls and and often they are really one and the same so of course as an industry for a lot of reasons we do have compliance and regulatory requirements that we as organizations have to uphold depending on what we do right maybe pci if we accept credit cards and that's a contractual requirement and so in validating for those regulatory we will express them in in the context of controls we have a control here you know in that you're only allowed to log in we you can see how the access to github is controlled via maybe the you know the certificates that we've configured for the access which then gives us two forms of access rather than just one etc so we'll still often describe them but when i when i work with the engineering teams i take the approach of calling them guardrails because what we inherently want is flexibility we want the ability for the engineers to not you know maybe to to use an analogy so to speak shoot themselves in the foot and make a a really bad choice that's going to harm the project or the organization but similarly you know if we've got 10 developers on the team give them four different approaches and and ways that all work depending on their their personal styles and so maybe that's just implementing four different types of controls in that that allow but collectively call that a guardrail that hey here's the things that we want to absolutely prohibit but we want you to be you develop in the style that that's best for for yourself and and for your outcomes and and have that flexibility i think that flexibility is at the heart of what i consider a guardrail versus a a control a control is a specific thing that accomplishes a specific outcome yeah yeah I and mean, i think you know words do matter in communicating that you know and, and the notion of guardrails are are there to help you versus controls that are there to harm you how often do you allow developers to unilaterally choose to override a guardrail versus not and when when you think about the guardrails you put in place yeah. you know, how often are they hard versus you know left to development teams to decide that that's a great one i would say it it specifically depends on the specific guardrail so for instance let's take secrets in code right detecting secrets embedded in in code can be of course very tricky so we can certainly apply some regex patterns as code is checked in that says oh this looks like a secret there's a great example where we would allow the the dev to override it right and and really truly what i would call a guardrail where we've got some some regex patterns that are looking for things that might be an embedded secret during the check-in process it pops up a warning and says hey this looks like a secret 
We want to confirm, is this a secret or not a secret? Gives them the opportunity to say, no, this isn't a secret, you know, at a note. So we've logged that, yes, we're still doing our due diligence of looking for that. Hey, this is a false pattern. We can then take that, that back so we can continue to tune our regexes. So allow the developer to overwrite that, continue the code commit to finish, but yet we've got a good guardrail in place. Whereas other sorts of guardrails, like perhaps not allowing single factor commits to, to get without, there is no override for that one. Or perhaps another one would be when committing to the production, only certain authorized individuals in the engineering team have the ability to perform that activity versus all of the, you know, actor, you know, engineers on a, on a team per processes. So it really comes down to the specifics of which guardrails in place, how stringent, what the rules associated with the overrides would be. Yeah, no, very cool. And I think it's probably a good thing to define as well. And it sounds like you're you're using a combination of sort of security requirements like that access and uh, accuracy. I guess sometimes, you know, all, all developers and frankly, security teams that really love them as well have experienced the notion of having a a low accuracy control, which in turn requires security to be able to override it. And that ends up, uh, no, nobody, nobody's pleased with that, uh, with that situation. Absolutely not. <laughs> well, and, and you're accomplishing nothing, right? You know, the, the thing is you've got, you've always got to be stepping back. I don't think this is unique to security and going, is this guardrail accomplishing what we intended to accomplish? If we're not doing that that analysis, then then we're failing. I think in our roles. So Tim, like a lot of what you described right now, I think you know we'll probably have a a bit of a selection bias here with the listeners, but still a lot of security people, you know, would would default to nodding their heads and and saying this this makes sense, and yet a lot of security people do not practice that in their day to day. You know, from from your experience, you know, in these different lenses, what gets in the way, like? Why doesn't everybody operate this way? Oh, that's a that's a great question. I think it's a combination of things. Often it's expertise thing. All of these different disciplines like engineering and development, you know, in my case, I, I have a background in it. I've continued to maintain those skills over the years. Having that common communications language with the engineering teams obviously is is indispensable. And so certainly it is not uncommon for a security team to not have any one in the team that has that ability, that that background that allows them to understand kind of maybe some of those ramifications. I think similarly sometimes it's simply that you know, the need for security has just exploded so fast. You know, in my case, I am incredibly fortunate. I've I've made a lot of career choices specifically to go work with people that were the best of the best. So I could continue to elevate my skills, right? And so it is very common to have IT security people who just haven't come from that maybe technical background or had that opportunity to work and mentor under folks that are are just incredibly uh, skilled at the profession of security. And and so they have a very, maybe an audit focus or, you know, kind of control focus view. And as always, right, that that's an opportunity for us as engineering teams to, to help them understand, hey, get passionate. You know, what I would challenge folks is to go the other direction uh, and try and meet in the middle. Hey, security team, we love to produce secure code, but this is actually slowing us down and, and hindering us. What if we tried this way instead? That that would always be my challenge for, for folks like that. You know, just like some security folks maybe fall into the trap of thinking that, oh, well, they don't want to do it securely. I, I completely disagree. I don't, I don't think any engineer wants to produce insecure code. Certainly, I've not run into one yet. I think we in the industry, IT security industry, often just make it too complicated and convoluted, right? The other direction, right, we can go help, help simplify and help our, our security folks better understand engineering and meet in the middle so we can all produce better results would be my suggestion. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in, uh, I'm I'm a big fan of DevOps analogies, and that's precisely you know the uh, some of the core principle when we talk about breaking the barriers between Dev and Ops is you know walk a mile in their shoes, embed in teams. Absolutely. But it really is all about uh, all about empathy. I love uh, I love the the point you make there about development teams sometimes feel like they're too often you sort of hear a bit of a victim mentality sometimes from you know sometimes even surprising when you talk about dev teams that are otherwise quite empowered but talking about security team this and security teams that so well did you you go up and try to propose an alternative that's actually probably under underdone you know like probably not a lot of teams uh, do that they feel like security is this mandate when sometimes maybe people on the security side would be receptive they just don't know uh, how to how to apply it I think that's definitely the case more and more often, right? Certainly, there are still very much security teams out there that kind of take a, a uh, very control forceful mandate approach. But, you know, in speaking to peers, that's becoming less and less the case. And specifically because I think those of us who are partnering, which is more and more and more of the industry, are producing much better results, right? You, we can do so much to get more together. SRE is a is a great example. You know, that so many of the outcomes that site reliability engineering is looking to achieve just overlaps significantly with what we want to achieve in security, or at least approaches to achieve in security. And so, there's just such a fantastic opportunity to move both of those needles in positive directions, right? So, and and in the end, produce better outcomes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. So maybe taking the, you know, we talked a little bit about the minimum, maybe talk a bit about the maximum. So when you think about the split of responsibility between, you know, development teams and security teams, when you think about the optimal setup that you think we sort of strive at, what would you say that is, right? Like what's the, the correct end goal in terms of, you know, dev security, you know, security uh, guardrails, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so using controls, I'm typically on the other side of that. What, what's the panacea there? I, that's a great question. I, you know, ultimately, the responsibility for producing secure code has to rest on the, on the shoulders of the engineers because they're producing the code. Where security's role in there is to partner with them to produce, you know, to really optimize the processes and the tooling to support them in being successful in that, right? You know, I think it all starts at the architecture, right? Have we defined a good architecture for the environment? We're all in agreement that this is how we're going to do identity access management. This is how we're going to do, you know, start with those, those core in our organization. These are our standards. And once we've got that defined, right, then it allows the engineering teams to go fast because, you know, part of the, the, the standards are just technical standards. Part of the standards, of course, should also reflect the security requirements and be part of that. Then we partner on the good processes, the effective tooling, and then everybody just goes fast, right? And, the, and I think there's also a real big component in there where a really good security team is going to be very consultative, right? My product security team does a ton of work on analysis. A lot of the, especially the legacy tooling, if you think about specific security flaws like um, cross-site scripting, right? You know, very easy thing to creep into our code. Often a tool will say, oh, you have 500 cross-site scripting problems in your, in your code. But when you do the analysis, it's, it's four or five maybe lines of code that are actually producing all of those individual cross-site scripting results. And so taking that manual step before we, you know, if we throw 500 issues to the engineering team, that's doing no one any favors. That's not helpful. Uh, if instead, though, we take the time to really trace that back in the security team, because we've got the expertise in development, that instead we go, hey, we've got five lines of code that, that and by the way, this is what, this is, this is how you rewrite that line of code to, to not have that issue. It's a great opportunity for 
not just improving the security, but improving our engineering team's ability and, and hopefully, again, drive those number of defects down over time. You know, from my perspective, the number we should be counting is five there, not 500. If we're going to the engineering teams and saying, hey, there's five, five issues we, we'd like you to get resolved in your next sprint, or if we go and say, hey, you got to fix those 500, and we've not taken that extra step to, to help them understand what the real root cause is, then, then we're not effectively partnering. So that, that's what I think that really mature, healthy interplay between security and, and engineering teams looks like. Yeah, that, that sounds like a, a good reality. So I guess when you, when you think about hiring for your team, uh, and maybe specifically the product security team, you know, what do you, what do you look for? And maybe, you know, what are some red flags or, you know, what do we try to avoid, you know, in, in your quest to, uh, to reach that destination? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So, so for product security in particular, I go for engineers, right? People with experienced track records in a, in a modern engineering environment, multiple languages, just as if I was hiring them for an engineering and development team, because Teaching someone product security and secure code is much easier than teaching engineering to someone who only understands the product security pieces or, or understands. And I find that's the case in most most of the, the security in, I think, modern IT security. We have, you'll find a lot of folks with, with deep engineering backgrounds. Similarly for operations, right? How Having people that have gotten SRE backgrounds or network backgrounds or that, and then teaching them the security because they're passionate about it and they want to maybe learn and broaden their career. Much better outcomes, I find, uh, consistently going that direction. Yeah, for sure. And I think we, earlier on, this was also a great hiring methodology to staff up. Although today I'd say, you know, dev scarcity might be, you know, getting up there to, uh, <laughs> to kind of match the uh, security talent scarcity. So maybe hiring won't quite be, uh, quite be as easy. No, but that's definitely a recurring theme around sort of hiring engineers and how it's easier to teach engineers the relevant pieces of security than taking a security person who doesn't know how to code uh, or doesn't understand programming and, and teach them that. So one last question, maybe before I uh, always have this sort of a crystal ball question I like to ask at the end, but before we go there, one last question around KPIs. So you, you kind of threw out, you know, a KPI before talking about uh, sort of the defect backlog, but when you think about your KPI, what are your, what are your top three, right? If you had, I know that security is complicated, but if you, if you measure yourself, which actually maybe even practically as you measure yourself or, or your boss does, what are sort of the, the three top metrics that you use to, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's actually easy from my perspective. So I, I have three specifically that I take to our board of directors. First is what we call containment time. And so that's a measure of from the point at which we have a prevention failure, i.e. one of our preventative controls. And, and you know, maybe it's a, the example I like to use is it's Monday morning and the blood level in my caffeine system is too high. And I've clicked on a fish and had malware successfully detonate my laptop. That's an example of what I call a prevention failure. And so, of course, the, the threat actor, right, the cyber criminal, they've got an intention. You know, maybe they want to, you know, deploy ransomware or whatever their goal is. That's just their foothold. And so at that point, it's a race. And so containment time is all about how do we contain that threat actor before they accomplish their, their goal. And from, our from goal is to have that three hours or less, right? Because that just doesn't give the, the threat actor enough time to, to harm, hopefully, the organization meaningfully. And ultimately, what it is, is it's a really effective measure of the effectiveness of our detection and response capabilities, right? And this is and then, from uh, the containment time is from detection to containment. So the it doesn't... containment time is from detection to containment. That's right. We have an overall one that we call, you know, the, the overall from the point at which the actual prevention failure occurs to containment, which is basically the time window when we're vulnerable. But we have to compute that separately, whereas containment time is from the, the moment of basically we know we've got a, a problem. Then the second 
KPI is prevention failures, simply a count of prevention failures. And, and we take this again very broadly uh, because ultimately it's a measure of the effectiveness of our preventative controls in our organization. But this would also be things like, uh, you know, relevant for this, of course, we have a bug bounty program, right? And so if a researcher, you know, submits a bug bounty, we count that also as a prevention a prevention failure and measure to containment time for when we've mitigated that risk. Now, it's not publicly available, but we still treat it that same way. Because uh, at the end of the point, end of the day, if a researcher was able to exploit some sort of system in a way that was not intended, then we've had a preventative failure. And then our, our third KPI would be the one I mentioned early, and that's product security defects. And so in that case, what we do is we snap a line at the end of every quarter, how many open, high or critical product security defects do we still have in our, our product? And our, our goal is to be to zero by, you know, uh, for each, each, because of course, that number will, will again, fluctuate over time, right? We, we've got some new code development and that introduced some new defects. Or maybe we ran a red team exercise and we identified some, some ODAs or some other things. But the goal is you know, to have then the appropriate processes in play and partnership with those teams so that we've you know, got proven processes to identify and close those on a continual basis with a goal being that what we're shipping to our customers has no known product security defects in them. Uh, you know, given what we do, of course, as an organization, a, a nightmare scenario for me is that some sort of uh, cyber criminal was able to leverage our products uh, as that that vehicle to compromise one of our customers. And, and so, of course, product security is one of our primary focuses as, as a result. <laughs> Yeah, no, it makes uh, th those are uh, are great because they cover like every every gap or every sort of you know hole that I see in those tends to for the most part be be addressed a little bit by by the previous one and many yeah. of them are quite uh, quite um, measurable. The prevention failure is probably the one that is like least measurable because it almost incentivizes you to not know right. Like prevention <laughs> failure implies sure. you found a problem. Yeah late right you know so you need to invest i mean how do you how do you reconcile that right it's almost like from, no that's from a great kpi it sort of you know that, incentivizes that, you yeah. to not do any you know not do a bug bounty or not do sort of pen testing right no that's a great question i you know the key there is integrity i think as an industry i i feel incredibly strongly that us as defenders have to have unassailable integrity and, and, you know, the, the thing that, that I repeat with my team, right, is the number is just a tool to accomplish things, right? It's really more about this is a dashboard, right? At one point in my career, I, I spent uh, time at General Electric. And, and for those who are familiar with GE, they're really the home of Lean Six Sigma, right? And, and that approach of process optimization is just hugely valuable. And so, all of these, right, the, the prevention failures are ultimately useful because, one, we want to understand what was the root cause so that we can constantly improve that, that prevention control and on an ongoing basis. And, you know, like everything else, just like if we have an operational failure, throwing people under the bus and blaming versus a, a blameless root cause analysis, right, it's the same thing in security what understand what went wrong how can we fix it etc and and again I, I, what i found is that creating that culture where people want to know what all of the preventive failures are so we can go after making things better inevitably leads to innovation you know fun fact my my last team prior to mandiant my final week there we were awarded our 14th patent in cybersecurity, and and that was a retail organization. So, you know, these things, if we build our culture correctly, just incentivize innovation out of our folks in that partnership. And I don't know many engineers that don't love to innovate. <laughs> yeah, I know for sure, and it aligns with the engineers. And I feel like we probably, you know, I, I had that sort of uh, on my list of sort of things to talk about culture, but we're kind of running out of time <laughs> to sort of really open that up. <laughs> that we're going to need to kind of get you back here and uh, and and probably spend a whole episode on uh, 
on the cultural aspects. Oh, do, I'd love that. I think that's a huge, important factor of our success is the cultures we build. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tim, tons of great insights here, you know, concrete tips and things to, uh, you need to do as well as kind of broad perspective. Thanks for that. Before I, uh, I let you go here, one last question. So if you took out your crystal ball and you thought about someone in your, or you looked at someone in roughly your position in five years time, what would you say would be most different about their reality? Oh, that's a great question. Five years from now, I think what's interesting about the last five years is the speed and the pace and the complexity has grown logarithmically, I think is probably the appropriate word. And I don't see that stopping anytime soon. I think what probably going to be forced to happen is much more uh, specialization is going to be occurring, right? Um, a lot of our security groups and, and leaders have had to or have been able to uh, be very generalists. And I think the, the, the role as a uh, security leader is going to continue to evolve to be much more about leadership and focusing on the culture and having really strong really deeply skilled experts leading the various aspects of, of, of our security programs. And I think that'll be a, a, a fun change. I think the other interesting change that'll start to really manifest somewhere around the five-year mark is that inevitably, because we in the, as a profession have arguably been failing, and I would argue the, the fact that every year there are more breaches occurring than every prior year is hard data to prove that we haven't yet successfully uh, turned the corner. That's right. Which from my perspective is just awesome because it just means that there's still so much opportunity for innovation and, and figuring out better approaches. But that is leading to our various governments around the world to to lean in harder and farther and et cetera. And so it'll be interesting to see how that kind of evolves out. Historically, that has led to more problem, more harm than good because they try to regulate everything. But I'm seeing some really interesting positive signs around like CMMC in the United States where it's being much more driven by processes that are in place rather than kind of control oriented PCI version 4 which is which is out in draft form now for instance has also taken that similar approach where they define the outcomes we need to achieve rather than the hows and so as that starts to happen hopefully we'll take that path and and that will lead to Solving one of the fundamental biggest problems I would say we still have in the industry for people like me is you're kind of darned if you do, darned if you don't, right? Where if if you have a breach, you are both a victim and you're you're guilty for failing to protect the organization, right? And in whereas in in physical security like take banks or things like that, the industries and the governments have agreed upon kind of minimum based standards that as long as you can demonstrate you were adhering to those, you were just a victim rather than also guilty of of failing your customers or what have you. And until we kind of turn that corner in 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 an industry, roles like mine are, are kind of pro- uh, fraught with danger. But <laughs> a little bit. Some CISO had, you know, roll when uh, when there's a breach. Uh, That's right. Yeah, I, I, that I is, like uh, to say that a, a breach is a resume generating event in, in my industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think uh, so. It's an interesting view. Uh, actually, uh, Jeff Belknap from LinkedIn, you know, shared kind of, I think, a different, a similar perspective about, uh, about the changing legislation. And I think he was an example of of how you know, a variety of corruption cases have brought that into finance, you know, and sort of, I think it was Enron and, and sort of others that really introduced all sorts of CFO regulations to what was a bit more loose at the time. Uh, and today we take it for granted, which is that there are SOCs and there's all sorts of other sort of regulations that require you to do finance in a, in a certain way. Security is a slightly more creative field, you know, maybe than, uh, than finance, but it'll be interesting indeed to see uh, the, with the recent executive order and from Biden and, and, a, and a variety of others, see, see where that leads. 
So definitely interesting. I'm curious, just on the expertise comment, the first one, what examples kind of jump to mind? So like, you know, what, which expertise aspect? Um, well, I think there's there's lots of areas of expertise. Certainly, the our discussion today is is a good example one, right? If you're leading product security, then you should have a deep understanding in in you software know, engineering. Yeah, absolutely, software engineering operations. You know, all of those you know are obviously fields that take years and years to to master, right? But there's also very specialized things like reverse engineering and and things like that. Or another great example that a lot of your more mature security teams are focusing on is what is commonly being called now detection engineering. How do we build detection capabilities throughout our infrastructure and environments in, in creative ways rather than just maybe deploying network sensors? There's so many more ways to build effective, which has a lot of parallels with observability for the SRE field, for instance. But another example would be, it's become a critical skill in the last decade, is data analytics and machine learning. That is just absolutely, even up to the point of data science, right, is is just incredible capability when embedded in a security team, again, is just a force multiplier for our outcomes. And things like those low, those tooling that we, you know, mentioned earlier, that's, that's tons of false positives and stuff, right? There's so much more modern ways to go about achieving some of those outcomes uh, if we've got the those depth of capabilities. Yeah, indeed, you know, tapping into innovation. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for the examples. Tim, we've gotten long here, but you know, I think every, uh, every moment was a great conversation. Thanks so much for coming onto the show and uh, sharing some wisdom here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks everybody for tuning in and I hope you join us for the next one. Thanks for listening to The Secure Developer. That's all we have time for today. To find additional episodes and full transcriptions, visit thesecuredeveloper.com. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or get involved in the community, find us on Twitter at at DevSecCon. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes if you enjoyed today's episode. Bye for now.